This is HRS TV, and I'm Eliani Mejia from our program Inside the EP Lab. And it's my honor to have today uh, Dr. Tolga Aksu uh, from Turkey, Istanbul, who has been the expert in this new idea uh, that we've been all postulated about cardio neuroablation, right? Welcome to our segment, Tolga. It is my pleasure to have you with us. And I'm very excited uh, to talk with you about this cardio neuroablation. We all know in real life, we all been dealing with this patient with facial vagal mediated syncope. And we know that this is a parasympathetic overreactivity is the one that is the culprit that is uh, uh, exacerbating the symptoms in this patient. And sometimes, honestly, I feel frustrated when I see some of those patients that have a pacemaker, right? Young people that have a pacemaker, they're committed. Some of them that are symptomatic, they do. So actually this idea has been illustrated a different way to approach this patient. So I want to I wanna thank you for being in our segment and I want to talk with you about this and how you do it, how you approach it. I love your recent article, so tell me more about it. Thank you so much, Alani. It's my pleasure to be here. Actually, uh, as you mentioned, uh, cardio neuroablation seems as a relatively new strategy, but we have uh, a lot of data uh, since 2005. So uh, today, uh, more than 25 centers in US and many more in Europe performing cardio ablation. And as you mentioned, actually, uh, our main target uh, or our main target population should be younger uh, Vazovaga syncope case because, as you know, that there is no randomized controlled trial demonstrating positive effect of cardiac pacing in this population. I think that uh, we should focus this population because we especially if we see just cardio inhibitor response, we have no medications like midodrenal, glucocortisone. We, we have no uh, clear option for this patient. And according to guideline, still we don't know the best strategy for this patient. So I think that patient sh selection should be similar with cardiac pacing, except the patient uh, age. In younger population, we suggest to perform CNA in the first option, but in older population, it's not easy to differentiate structural involvement of sinus node or AV conduction. So in older population, I think still uh, pacemaker should be the first option. Yeah. So that, what you said, uh, differentiated between functional uh, AV block versus actually structural disease. Uh, he mentioned about younger patients versus older patients. So tell me, uh, I was reading all your articles and how you selected. So differentiated the functional AV block is the key, right? The patient selection. So how you approach this case, this, how you do it? I know that it sounds face of bagel, but I need to document it. How you actually go step by step? Yeah, actually, the most difficult population for CNA is the patient with AV block because it's not easy to differentiate real functional AV block. Actually, if there is just paroxysmal AV block episodes, for example, in uh, halter recording or uh, ECG tracing, you just see high degree AV block, especially during evening time or night time. And then uh, you have to check PP and PR interval change during AV block or during one to one AV conduction. If you see clear PP a prolongation during AV block, it's a, a clear clue for a functional nature of AV block, especially in a younger population. And then, of course, we have to check uh, atropine response during electrophysiological study, and we have to check AH and HV interval change before and after atropine administration. And then we have to check exercise stress test response and we have to demonstrate there is no worsening on AV block during exercise stress test. These three yeah. steps are very important to differentiate totally structural involvement of AV conduction system. And then we can try to uh, perform CNA in this population. But in our cohort, actually we are in a referral center for CNA, but despite this uh, difference, actually, uh, maybe five or 10 percent of patients uh, was found as functional AV block at the end of all these studies. So this is a very, very small population. Yeah. So uh, studying the patient is the key. Looking at the events, right? If we have documentation of the event, looking at that slowing heart rate, progressive is slowing, weakened back perhaps, and then follow that change in PR. 
response to atropine that we you guys normally do it in the EP study to see how they respond to it. So I have a question for you. For those patients, do you think that are we bringing back the tilt table test at some point to induce those syncopies or, or we just bring it to our EP lab and get it done? Because it's hard to have the documentation while you're having syncope. It could be a loop recorder, you know, but some patients don't. Are we bringing back that? Are, do you suggest it or what do you think about it? Great question. Actually, in Turkey, due to financial reasons, we can't implant loop recorder. Yeah. So I, I, all my experience related to tilt testing, but I strongly believe the power of tilt testing to demonstrate cardio intercomponent. Mm -hmm. The main issue, how you perform tilt testing. So you have to uh, teach your nurse to uh, tilt testing and the room should be very quiet and some other things very important and then which protocol do you use uh, for example we use uh, still provocative um, till testing uh, 20 minutes uh, with without medication and then 20 uh, minutes with uh, nitroglycerin or isoproteranol so i i think that the most important uh, question to demonstrate contribution of cardiac intercomponent so during syncope episodes in tilt testing, if you see clear cardio inhibitor response, we usually see a step-by-step -step increase on heart rate level during tilting, and then we see a steep decrease on heart rate. So actually, relative bradycardia cause occurrence of syncope episodes. This is why classical pacemaker or even uh, rate drop response pacemaker are not effective in patient with vasovagal syncope because just relative bradycardia after sinus tachycardia cause um, global yeah. cellular hyperperfusion and then syncope episode. So I, I believe the power of tilt testing for patient selection. And in all CNA studies, actually uh, all groups use tilt testing to select their patients. And as another important advantage, it's, it's easy to differentiate possible contribution of vasodepressory component because, for example, if we see mixed uh, response in tilt testing, but there are a lot of uh, syncope episode, we start midodrine in the first attempt, and then we try CNA, but we say the patient that after CNA, we can still see some syncope episodes due to vasodepressory component. So we yeah. start midodrine. Yeah. So uh, this is good. So selection of patient is key, knowing the mechanism and the pathophysiology that induce that functional IV block that is sometimes hard, specifically for those young patients that are very vaguely mediated, that you actually can tell in the holder uh, and their symptoms. So again, Perhaps we have uh, the tilt test a little bit coming back for documentation of that cardio inhibitory syncope. So now that we have that selection of cases, right? You have the patient that we know, uh, we go to the EP lab, right? So there's been a lot of data saying where the anatomy, where those ganglionic GPs are, right? Left, right, posterior media. So what is your approach briefly? Uh, and once you localize them, how you know that is it's the, the site that you want to ablate and what parameters do you use? Yeah, this is this is another important but difficult question. Uh, actually, three uh, techniques are usually used by operator: high frequency stimulation, uh, EGMs, or amplic anatomical ablation. So we currently use a fragmentation on electrogram to select our target area because we believe that incursion of neuronal fibers cause some fragmentation on electrogram, and we actually know possible distribution of GPs based on our anatomical knowledge. So if we see fragmented electrograms in these possible sites, it should be related to GPs or autonomic nerve innervation. So uh, we always perform biatrial ablation. Actually, we recently published a meta-analysis in heart team, and we demonstrated that if you use just right atrial approach, it's, it may be related to more syncope recurrence during follow-up because actually uh, autonomic nerve system consists of epicardial ganglia plus postganglionic neuronal fibers from this GP site to sinus node or AV conduction system. So for example, during a right atrial ablation, you first eliminate postganglionic neuronal fibers to sinus node. So you can see a similar response, but during follow-up, you can see recurrence due to axonal regeneration process. This is a very important point. This is why we perform the atrial ablation. And uh, of course, we still don't know uh, which GPs should be ablated. For example, in all cases, do we have to perform, uh, ablate all GP sites? I don't know the answer because there is no comparative study. But 
Uh, now I know that our technique works very well, so I I am trying to keep it similar in all cases. But then of course we have to perform some comparison study with limited GP ablation or total GP ablation. So uh, I I saw you mentioned the six uh, sites mainly uh, the six GPs, uh, including the right superior, left superior, and the posterior media. So that's still your approach. You you go through those uh, six GP sites. Uh, yeah. And then we look at the electrocardiogram, right? So we have, we mentioned in the low amplitude fragmented uh, echocardiograms a, 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 and the high amplitude. So you do a mix. So your parameters is uh, 0 0.7 millivolts uh, for those areas. Actually, uh, actually uh, we, we perform, uh, we try to find fragmented electrogram regardless of low or high amplitude. Right. Actually, okay. the, the main issue- Fragmentation. Yes, we changed the bandpass filter to uh, classical 30 to uh, 500 to uh, 200 and 500 hertz. This is very important because we are trying to uh, calculate the real number of uh, fragmentation. And if we see more than three deflection on electrograms, we got so high or low amplitude, we are trying to perform ablation and we are trying to eliminate these electrograms. Okay. So it, it seems to be that we do atropine during the study, right, to see the response, uh, and then we just do electroanatomic mapping by atrial mapping, looking at those sites in the right and in the left, looking at all this uh, EGMs and look for the fragmentation. So then you target it. So uh, what are your parameters? You use irrigation catheter with high uh, power, or what are your parameters and the duration of it? Yeah, this is a very important point. Actually, uh, low, uh, low, um, high power ablation is not needed for epicardial ablation because we are trying to perform uh, ablation in epicardial sites. So I think that classical parameter is like 35 watts for anterior sided GPs and uh, 25 watts for uh, posterior sided GPs. Actually, there is only one GP in posterior wall. This is the uh, left inferior GP. In other, in all, all other GPs, we perform ablation with 35 watts. We don't use high power ablation in any uh, CNA mm -hmm. cases. And you can use contact force catheter or uh, the other ablation catheter and the result will not change. But uh, your response may change uh, based on the anesthesia. This is a very important point. If you use mild sedation, uh, you will see more vagar response during RF application. But if you use general anesthesia, it will cause a blunting on parasympathetic and maybe in sympathetic response. It will completely change sinus rate, baseline sinus rate or some other parameters. So we should uh, understand this difference before the procedure. Yeah, definitely can change the response. So Tolga, thank you so much for this uh, explanation. And just to conclude, where do you think that we're going? And what are your, what are your future uh, predictions for this CNA approach? Thank you so much. Actually, I think that we need a sham control study to change guidelines. So we are trying to do that. This is very important because, you know, there is a placebo effect in vasovagal syncope cases. So I think we need a sham control study. We need some uh, well-designed randomized controlled trials. And then, uh, of course, we have to find the uh, perfect technique. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Tola, for being with us at Heart Rhythm TV. Uh, so bringing you uh, discussion and things that are coming and that we've been practicing. I think that all of us has been uh, eager to learn more and actually doing AFib ablations. We even, uh, if without trying to do, we even ablated some uh, plexi, we can see those response. Uh, so we are, as a community, eager to see your work. And thank you for being with us today. And see you next time.